And here we go. We're now recording. All right, so we have um, either two or three framing questions uh, remaining to cover from, from chapter 18. Uh, the first of which that we'll deal with is this one. Uh, what is speciation and how can it be adapted? And if you want to if you want to break it down chapter by chapter, it's it's strange the way the textbook did this, but uh, chapter 19 is basically focusing on microevolution, allele frequencies, and how do they change within populations. 18, the big focus of 18 is speciation, which is really okay. So if you have enough change at the population level, can we generate reproductively isolated populations? Because at that point, arguably, you have separate species. And then 20 is really talking about, okay, well, can we extrapolate these forces and say this is what generated all of the diversity of life? Okay? And if, and if you don't have a creator, then the answer to that question has to be yes, because that's really the only way to explain the diversity of life apart from there's a creator that created some of the diversity of life. Okay? Don't know exactly how much, don't know how much diversification has happened since creation, but we could, we could maybe figure that out. Um, all right, so uh, here's now getting into the, the focus of chapter 18. So what is speciation and how can it be adaptive? So in order to answer this question, we need to define a species. And uh, this is fun. It's fun. So we have a couple of different uh, species concepts or definitions. The first one's called the biological species concept. And this is basically what I've already said, that if two populations are reproductively isolated, they are separate species. If two populations are reproductively isolated, then they are separate species. You could look at it the opposite way and say if two populations are capable of reproducing or individuals from two populations can reproduce together, then they are the same species. It's a biological species concept. Morphological species concept is basically this. If, if two individuals or if the individuals of two different populations look different, then they're different species. So if you can match an organism to a population based on the way it looks, then they're separate species. You can look at this one also in the opposite way, uh, that if individuals from two separate populations, you can't match them to their population, then those two populations must be the same species. Right? So if you, if you, if you, you can't, they look so similar that you can't tell the individuals from those two populations apart, then those two populations are the same species. And then the last one we'll talk about, the phylogenetic. Everyone loves, this is everyone's favorite definition of a species, because anything to do with phylogenies or phylogenetics is everybody's favorite thing ever, right? And so the phylogenetic species concept basically says this. When you get to a point that you can't split the branch anymore. There's absolutely nothing you could use to split that branch into smaller branches. You've now found a species. When you can no longer split a branch into any more branches using anything, using molecular tools, using morphological tools, that you have nothing at your disposal that could split that branch. Now you've discovered a species. It's, it's basically the uh, least inclusive branch or the most exclusive branch, however you want to look at that. This one's fun. Basically what ends up happening is um, every population becomes a unique species essentially under the phylogenetic species concept, which is fun. Now, we can do this. Have any of you ever sent a saliva sample to 23andMe or Ancestry.com or any of those entities to, to trace your ancestry? Oh, nobody. Well, that's fantastic. Anyways, so the, 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 way, the reason it works is because certain genetic signatures tend to cluster in particular areas. And so you can match your ancestry based on shared genetic signatures because of a particular region your ancestors are from. 
the fact that you can do that is showing us that there are different branches within our species. Because if there weren't, you couldn't match your genetic material to a particular group. Okay, and so according to the phylogenetic species concept, every time we can generate like this is a genetic signature for, you know, Northwestern Europe. This is a genetic signature for England and Ireland. All of those would be treated as separate species under the phylogenetic species concept, which is kind of fun. So it's like you've got your Northern England, Scottish Ireland species of humans. And then you've got your French German species of humans, and it's just kind of fun. I mean, it's, it's nonsense, but it's kind of fun. And so, um, what is the value of the biological species concept? And again, this is basically the idea: if two individuals, or if or if if, if two populations are reproductively isolated, those are separate species. Or the opposite. If an individual from each of those populations are capable of reproducing together, one individual from each, then those two populations are the same species. What's the value of this species concept? Any thoughts, Levi? Um, it's not overly, or it's not overly interpretive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's very objective. It eliminates a, a great deal of the bias involved in like, well, I mean. You know, this feature seems to be important. This one is not as important. You know, I can tell these apart based on... It's, it's very objective, right? So if, if an individual from each population are not capable of reproducing together, then those populations must be separate species. Okay? It's very objective. Micah? And you have to take into account that some of those that can reproduce, reproduce sterile. Right, right, right. So then you, then you have to say, okay, well, what does it mean to reproduce? Right, are we talking about like they can form offspring, but the offspring are sterile? Or are we talking about they can form offspring, the offspring aren't sterile, but they're very clearly compromised. They're not as fit as any individual species. So you do get into a little bit of, you have to start to assess what do we mean by reproducing? And, and basically the idea is that if they can reproduce and form viable offspring that have the same or better average fitness than an individual, average individual from one of the populations, then they're the same species. So you're, are you thinking like a horse and a donkey, yeah. right? We're very clearly two separate species, but they are capable of forming offspring, but they form an offspring in a mule that is sterile. Or a zonkey or a zorse, same idea, okay? We would still define those as separate species under the biological species concept, because even though they can reproduce, they're forming something that is either sterile or it has a much lower fitness than an average individual from those populations. Yeah, it's a good question. Any other values you can see to the biological species concept? Zonkey? Zorse? Zorse. It's a good one. Yeah, Allison. Absolutely. Yeah, so it, it, it's objective, and then it also it, it gives you something that is it's very easy to record those data, right? Uh, very easy to record those data, good. Um, what are some limitations of the biological species concept? And I know this is not a typical lecture break, so you might be thinking like, oh, this is awesome. Like, we're talking about this, but I don't need to write any of this down. That would be a very wrong way to address <laughs> what's happening right now. What are some limitations of the biological species concept? Yes, Tara. Not necessarily, because if, if enough time has passed, you, you, you have to assume that at some point you're going to generate enough genetic differences that, that they can't actually reproduce. They, you, you would expect that, even if all of them root back to the same ancestor. I mean, in the same way, like, you know, if you were to take two random human individuals, right, and, the, and their, their shared ancestor is, you know, several hundred years ago, you should be able to, you would assume that you would see more differences between those two individuals than you would between one of those individuals and, and somebody that shares a more recent ancestor with them, right? So the, the, the further back you have to go to get to that shared ancestor, the, the more differences there should be, both genetic and morphological. What about for fossil forms? 
how helpful is it to define species this way for extinct forms that no longer exist? Yeah, it's, it's not helpful at all. Like, if, if an individual, if, if two populations are reproductive with the isolate, you have no idea, right? I don't know if you knew this or not, but fossils don't reproduce, right? They are, not, they are no longer living forms, okay? So it's not very helpful. Okay, it's not very helpful. And then it's not very helpful for organisms that do not reproduce sexually. Right? There are a number of species, plants, fungi, even some animal species that do not reproduce sexually. It's not very helpful to define species this way for those types of organisms. Because every individual is reproductively isolated. So that would make every individual a separate species, which is silly. Or maybe it isn't. I don't know. Morphological species concept obviously helpful in those cases, right? In the cases where the biological species concept does not provide you any value, the morphological species concept does. All right. So population, I've used this term several times, haven't really defined it. Um, basically, a population is a group of the same species that share a collective gene pool. So if the gene pool of one population, that should say population, it's kind of jumping the gun a little bit. If the gene pool of one population becomes isolated from the other population, speciation has occurred. And you have a separate species. Got a little excited in writing that statement. Now, what's going to provide for speciation? How's it going to happen? What mechanisms do we have to change a population? Bottleneck events, so genetic drift, what other mechanisms? Natural selection, sexual selection, mutations, gene flow, right? And so these mechanisms are what are going to provide the fuel for populations to change. So this happens uh, as a result of microevolution. So speciation is just a form of microevolution, okay? Speciation generating new species is a form of microevolution. Okay, this is really important to keep in mind. Okay? It is not macroevolution. All you've done is generate reproductively isolated populations. Okay, now they may look different, um, but oftentimes they 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 don't even all look all that different. All right, so there are different forms of speciation. First one is called allopatric. Allopatric, which means different lands. And uh, so this involves a geographic isolation. You start with geographic isolation, and then over time it, it develops into reproductive isolation. A lot of this is due to dispersal, right? So like a, pot, uh, a small subset of individual finches from the mainland leave and go establish a population on the first island in the Galapagos archipelago, okay? And now you have a geographic isolation separated by ocean. And then some individuals from that first island go and pop and, and form a population on the next island. And again, we've got geographic isolation. Make sense? Cool. Wait. Yes, sir. Uh, so if they are geographically isolated and gene flow is limited, so there's, there are limited uh, opportunities for individuals to move from one population to another. Both populations are going to, in theory, develop um, unique features due to microevolutionary forces, either because of natural selection or genetic drift or unique mutations or unique yeah, sexual selection is probably not going to be particularly active unless it was already active in the original population. All right. Parapatric speciation, so it's um, like neighboring lands, and so this happens when you have populations, they're still in physical contact, there's still a place in which the two populations merge, uh, but there are significant areas in which they do not overlap. You oftentimes see parapatric speciation in, in what we call a ring species, and I'll show you an image of this where you have several different populations surrounding like a mountain range. Like you have a species that only lives at low elevation and then there's a mountain range 
And so you have all these different neighboring populations surrounding this mountain range, and every one of them is just a little bit different. It's a little bit different. And then the last one is Sympatric, the same land. And so this is basically speciation happens within the same population. This is extremely rare to find cases of Sympatric speciation, which makes sense because if they're in the same geographic area, they should be reproducing randomly. Okay? The only time you see this happen is when there's an enormously powerful sexual selective force. Enormously powerful sexual selective force. Okay. okay, second part of this question. First part of this question, what is speciation? Do you have an idea of what that is? Okay, true or false? Speciation is a form of microevolution. True. Okay, all you've done is generate reproductively isolated populations. We haven't generated anything really novel, like no new genetic material other than maybe some mutations but we're not we're not building anything new or unique now if the microevolutionary force that led to the reproductive isolation was natural selection then we would call this adaptive speciation okay remember natural selection is the only adaptive evolutionary force and so if it was natural selection that resulted in the reproductive isolation we would call this adaptive speciation Otherwise, we'd just call it speciation. Okay. Where would be the most common place to find an example of adaptive speciation? First of all, which of these three would be the most likely culprit? Allopatric, parapatric, or sympatric? Allopatric, why? If it's due to natural selection, it has to be because the environments are different, right? The environments can't be different if the populations, if it's the same population, right? So if the environments are different, we've got some geographic isolation. Where would be a very common place to find that? I, I give you an example when I was talking about allopatric speciation. Yeah, Tara. Islands, Islands right? Mainland. Is that what you said, Levi? No, I said the ocean. Oh, the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's basically the same thing. <laughs> All right. So here are some examples of separate species and uh, so we have the northern spotted owl and we have the mexican spotted owl and right now what, what what here all of the purple are is is outside of the range okay you do not find these individuals here you find the northern spotted owl here you find the mexican spotted owl there it probably was originally a single continuous population and then you develop some geographic isolation or some individuals from either this population or this population dispersed and developed the geographic isolation, but probably uh, a case of allopatric speciation. <sighs> so here, honey creeper birds, um, and then where here you can really see an example of adaptive speciation where every species is very morphologically unique because it uses a different food source. And so what drove the reproductive isolation was, it was uh, natural selection and probably sexual selection, which is a form of natural selection, um, to, to meet their environmental demands. Right? Th that in, in various environments, they have different food sources available and so natural selection takes over and starts to generate some morphological differences. And those morphological differences are determined by genetic differences. Chris? Is the founder species, is that like an actual species? Yes. Or is it, oh, yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. This is a wonderful thing for most species now. When you, when you go and, and you can see very closely related species, we can almost always find the founder species. What, what basically, what they all start as. Because it's nice, we're dealing with small time scales. Yeah. Oh, so here is a, a mechanism for sympatric speciation. So I told you it usually only happens where you have really, really powerful sexual selective forces, but it, it actually happens pretty commonly in plants. Uh, animals can't really 
you, let's just say that most animals cannot handle having anything other than a diploid condition in their somatic cells, in their, in their non, uh, non-sex cells, okay? It just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work well. When the cells go to divide, they can't divide properly. There are checkpoints and they just shut down. And if the cells don't divide, you can't develop and grow and, and the organism just doesn't develop properly. Plants, plants deal with this just fine. And so you get uh, different numbers of chromosomes. That condition is called aneuploidy. When you have a different number of chromosomes than the typical two sets that you have. And so in plants, when this happens, sometimes it happens during hybridization events where two species hybridize. The sperm from one plant, the pollen from one plant fertilizes an ovum from another plant and they hybridize and then they form a unique species that then doesn't, uh, doesn't reproduce with either of the individuals or at least forms a somewhat reproductively isolated individual. And so here's more of a representation of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what I was just, this is what I was just, so here's the, um, a, a different in chromosomal number, uh, alloploidy, uh, aneuploidy, alloploidy, uh, resulting from a hybridization event. All right. Any questions about that? So of our three types of speciation, allopatric, parapatric, sympatric, which is going to be the most common? Allopatric, by far, followed by parapatric, and then very rarely do you get sympatric speciation. Although we're watching one. I don't know if I've mentioned this to you in a previous class, but it's kind of cool. We're watching one happen as we speak. I mean, as I speak to you, it's, it's in the process of happening, and it's in killer whales. I don't know if we've already talked about this, but uh, in almost every killer whale region, killer whales, you can find them all over the world, and in almost every region, you have basically two different behaviors. You have whale eaters and you have fish eaters. And so, the, and they don't reproduce together because the whale eaters can't use echolocation because then they would signal to their prey their presence. So they don't use echolocation. And so because they don't use echolocation, they don't communicate that way. And they don't, they just don't, they don't reproduce together. So you have very, very heavy sexual selection and it's actually creating two separate species of killer whale. Kind of cool. The whale eaters and the fish eaters. All right. Next question. Did you have a question, Allison? Oh, I was just wondering, so do the whales figure that out? I mean, the killer whales figure that out and then teach their offspring? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an enormous amount of teaching that goes on with hunting and killer whales. Yeah. And which is, which is actually really cool. If you go on a whale, usually when you go whale watching, you just, you watch like migrating whales maybe gray whales or humpback whales, and you just, you, you, know, you take your boat out to where they, they know that they'll migrate through. But there are some whale watching trips that you can do that go out to where they know that there's a feeding group, and you can actually watch a mom teaching its, its offspring how to hunt. It's really neat, really neat. Because they let them fail. I mean, they, they, they let them fail, and then they'll actually go hungry a little bit as, until they can figure it out. It's, it's very interesting, especially because you have some populations, um, you, you actually, you, you have some of your, some of your populations will feed on, on mammals as well, and they will actually beach themselves to grab a seal and then wait until the tide comes back in to pull themselves back into the ocean. It's really cool to watch like a really young killer whale try to pull that off. They don't do a very good job. <laughs> All right. What is the rate of speciation? All right. So how fast can this happen, right? Because I know you're sitting there and you're like, Dr. Ringo, this is wonderful. It's probably the best thing I've heard, not all week, but maybe all month. You're like, this is the third day of the month. Um, but I want to know, like, how quickly can this happen, right? We've got this geographic isolation. I got it, right? I got it. And I want to know how long until we get this reproductive isolation. That's a wonderful question. And so what I want you to do, we're going to take our lecture break here, and I want you to come up with a list of factors. Here, I'll tell you this. The rate of speciation, so don't look at the rest of the slide. If you've got these slides open, don't look at it. Don't cheat. OK? 
okay? Uh, the rate of speciation depends on a number of factors, and what I want you to do is working with those around you, I want you to come up, Anders, don't look at it, and I want you to come up with a list of some of the factors that are going to impact the rate of speciation, how quickly you can generate reproductive isolation, all right? Two minutes, starting now. All right. So as uh, as we come back together, I wanted to this this. I feel like I joke so much that when I say something sincere, y'all like people think I'm joking, but you know, this is like legitimately sincere. So I, I wanted to thank you all for your like your involvement in our lectures because I know talking to some other faculty, oftentimes they struggle to get more than half the class there, and this is a pretty low day for us, I would say, and we have 35 out of the 42 people enrolled in the class. Um, so like I I I am I am. I'm happy with the amount of uh, involvement that you put into this class. I like to think it's because I'm awesome. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, really, it's because I, I think it, it probably has a lot to do with the fact that our just lecture break questions end up on exams. And so it's like, oh, got to kind of, you know, be there to experience it a little bit. But anyways, uh, thank you. It, 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 it means a lot. So um, yeah, that's it. That's all I got. Anyways, all right. So, what are some of what are some of the factors? I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> so, I have cried five times as an adult. Five five times. I can I can I can name. No, I've never cried in class. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that would be. Gosh, I don't know what I don't know what it would take. I I, I just. It's not. I, I mean, I'm moved. I, I've been moved more than five times as an adult, but moved to tears has happened five times as an adult. The day I got married, the, I know, <laughs> uh, the day my three children were born, and uh, the day the Dodgers lost the World Series for the second year in a row. <laughs> <laughs> that one still does it a little bit. Remembering the day my kids were born, it doesn't really move me in the same way anymore. The Dodgers for the second year in a row. I'm just kidding. That, that fifth, I'm not going to share with you the fifth one, but I didn't cry when the Dodgers lost. I actually knew going into it that the Dodgers were going to lose for the second year in a row, so I was okay. All right, so what are some of these factors? It's all deteriorating. We're losing it. Tara. Shh. Y'all are being so rude to Tara. Sure. So natural disasters are going to be a major cause of drift, and so absolutely. So what what we would what we'll see this on Wednesday when we talk about ecology. But what we would say about that is the level of disturbance. 
And then that way it gets a little bit more general than specifying natural disasters, because disturbance is going to be any significant impact on the number of individuals in the population. Okay? And then it could be a natural disaster, it could be disease, it could be hunting, I mean, it could be a number of different factors, but yeah, the level of disturbance, absolutely. Chris? Uh, how often and how much they produce? Sure, yeah, so um, what, we, what we can do there is uh, average, average litter size or clutch size, um, or you can just do the average number of offspring produced. How about we do it this way? The average number of offspring produced by each individual in their lifespan. Yeah. Micah and then Mia. Okay, Mia. Um, maybe like how long their lifespan is, like we were talking about like bacteria, like how really short lifespans, like they reproduce and generations change. Yeah, they do, which is interesting unless they go dormant. So like if a bacterial cell goes dormant, I mean it could it could I mean it could theoretically last forever. But so can tardigrades, and tardigrades are animals and way more complex than bacteria. Levi. And then Cameron. Um, what about like uh Pressure from the environment, like pressure or absolutely. So you could just say, yeah, the strength of natural selection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So if you, especially if you've got allopatric speciation and you get like a founder effect, mm -hmm. where some individuals from your population leave and go and settle somewhere else, if if they're settling in an environment completely unique, I mean, you can have some pretty rapid uh, microevolution in response to the to the drastic change. Cameron. Uh, differences in behavior. Okay. Differences in behavior. And so the, uh, a lot of things would fall under that, right? Uh, different levels of sexual selection, different levels of competition within the species and then with other species. Yeah, so um, behavior, there, there, are, there are three big areas of behavior, three big categories when you're talking about animal behavior. Uh, the first is reproductive behavior. Uh, the second is competition. Uh, and the third is, is grouping, which oftentimes is influenced uh, by competition. But yeah, all of those are going to uh, heavily influence it. Micah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's reproduction, it's uh, competition, and it's uh, grouping behaviors. All right. So um, the rate of speciation uh, is, yeah, there are a number of factors. The, the first one that we'll talk about um, is if you can prevent all reproduction. So you can completely eliminate gene flow because what gene flow is is the movement of individuals from one population into another. If you can completely eliminate gene flow, this can happen pretty quickly. And so also the, the, the type of isolation has a, has a big factor as well. So we're going to talk about a couple of different categories of reproductive isolation. First category is called prezygotic. And so what does that mean? What is the zygote? It's the, uh, fertilized. Yeah, it's a cell that forms when you fertilize an ovum with the sperm. Okay? So the zygote is the embryo in a single cell stage. So prezygotic barriers prevent the zygote from forming. And so here we've got uh, different mechanisms to carry this out. Temporal is, what does that mean? having to do with time. So this is they reproduce at different times of the year. Behavioral, they just, uh, a lot of that is sexual selection. They just, maybe the, 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 the dance that the male does isn't quite the same, or the song that the male sings isn't quite the same. Habitat isolation, they live in the different, uh, a different habitat. They may live in the same geographic area, but maybe one of them is arboreal and lives in trees and one of them uh, does not. And then genetic barriers that even though they, they, they might try to reproduce, that the, the sperm of one species will not fertilize the ovum of the other. And then postzygotic barriers. This is what you brought up earlier, Micah. It's like, well, what about if the species can form offspring, but there's something, there's, there's something about the offspring. And so we've got uh, hybrid inviability. So that's they do reproduce, it does form a zygote, but the zygote either doesn't develop or develops and produces an individual that is significantly compromised uh, or hybrid uh, sterility. 
Uh, the mechanism of the speciation is also going to have a large impact on how quickly it happens. Um, the gradual speciation model basically argues that species diverge in small steps almost always due to natural selection. Okay, So the gradual speciation model is, is basically what, what Charles Darwin was putting forward when he published on the origin of species and what is the most popular idea of how speciation happens. It happens in small gradual steps due primarily to natural selection. So most of your speciation events would be adaptive under your gradual speciation model. But you can't go into an environment completely different because you're not adapted for it, right? So you've got to kind of step your way there, unless you are just a very generalist animal like a raccoon. And then you're like, it really doesn't matter where the raccoon lives, it's going to live the exact same lifestyle, right? It's going to find the closest garbage can and it's going to get itself inside that garbage can eat a full week's worth of food, and then go sleep somewhere for a week, right? Does it really matter whether they're in the desert, whether they're in the forest, whether they're anywhere? That's, that's basically the way a raccoon lives its life. Unless, of course, if they're in agriculture, then it'll just go eat a week's worth of corn off of the stalks and go find somewhere to sleep for a week. Oh, those are wonderful animals. You know, I lived in Ohio for four years, and a lot of people keep raccoons as pets. And uh, I actually, I met a guy and his job, his, like the, his legitimate job that he used to feed his family was he trained raccoons to be pets for people. I have a whole Twitter that I watch of my raccoons. Yeah, it is. I mean, they're, they're wonderful animals. They're very curious. Uh, if you have a female, they're very social. Males, not as much. Um, but yeah, I mean they're 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 interesting animals. You just have to give you have to deworm them all the time, because they they have a parasite that the eggs are incredibly dangerous for humans. So you have to deworm them all the time. But no big deal, right? You just just give them ivermectin. It's not that expensive. There's a cafe in South Korea, so raccoons have been introduced to South Korea. No, they don't eat raccoons. If that's what you're worried about, it's you go there and you get to have a an experience of eating with raccoons in the cafe <laughs> so they bring you your food and the expectation is is that part of the food is for you and part of the food is for the raccoons that live in the cafe and it's 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 it, I, I don't know if you've if you've been to south korea a lot or not but there aren't a lot of not developed areas like all, all, the, it's it's one of the most heavily developed countries in the world and so it's, that's their form of a petting zoo because there's not, there's not space to actually make a petting zoo. So we'll combine a petting zoo with a cafe. And it's just wonderful. It's wonderful. So, I, I mean, if you ever go there, you should, you should go to that cafe. All right, punctuated equilibrium model. So this is, this is where speciation is not happening rapid or slowly gradually due primarily to natural selection it's happening rapidly in 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 a very short period of time due mainly to genetic drift okay so in the gradual speciation model mainly natural selection very slow punctuated equilibrium mainly genetic drift very fast okay natural selection very slow. The slow is already, well, it just says in small steps, but this is slow, natural selection and slow, genetic drift and fast. Now, there may be other mechanism. Natural selection may be, may be involved, mutations may be involved, but it's mainly genetic drift. That's the mechanism that can work most quickly. Have you ever been looking at an animal and you're like, what on earth does, does this animal have this feature for? How is this feature helpful? Have you, ever, have you ever had that? Like you look at a sloth and you're like, how does hanging from a tree branch for hours at a time, how is that helpful? Like what, what's even going on? Sloths are, the sloths are awesome. If you've, never, if you've never seen the Jeffersonian sloth, you should look up the Jeffersonian sloth. It's named after Thomas Jefferson. And it's a, it's a grizzly bear sized ground sloth. It's, 
It's awesome. If you go to the La Brea Tar Pits, you can find them because they used to live here. They used to live in this. Do you have it, Anders? Yes, I do. Oh, it's fantastic. And so, and, and you're like, what on earth? Like, if, if, if universal common descent is true, how would natural selection ever have produced an organism that is so useless? <laughs> right? You're like, you're like, Chihuahua, that makes sense, because we did it, right? Natural selection didn't do it. Somebody decided, I want to make the absolutely most useless dog possible, and they started selecting for it, and you get a Chihuahua, okay? Right? If you love Chihuahuas, that's fine. You can love it, but you can't really argue. That, again, anyways, it's like, what are you going to do? Like, anyways, sorry. Um, but it's like, how, how on earth could natural selection have produced something like this that's just so strange and so seemingly useless? And for many of these really obscure animals, they didn't exist for very long. And you can tell that because you don't find very many individuals in the fossil record. So, like, they didn't have really large, geographically expansive populations. And you're like, why would natural selection produce something like this? And the answer is it, it, it probably didn't. It was probably genetic drift from some more useful uh, species. All right. Yeah. Are Jefferson's lost extinct now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately. They're awesome. Yeah, I mean, you had some really cool things during uh, during the last ice age, the Pleistocene ice age. You had beavers the size of black bears. Um, you had you had lions like African lions in all over North America and camels. Um, you had you had like dragonflies the size of dinner plates. Those are older. I mean, they're just there's some really cool things. Like the animals that we have now are just a sad representation of of the total diversity that we have. And you're like, wow, it's still an incredible representation of God's creative handiwork. And yet when you compare it to the amount of diversity that's existed in, in the past, it, it, I mean, it's just it's just a small glimpse. It's like reading the back of a book and trying to appreciate what the whole book was about. Another big one, this one came up, environmental stability. The less stable the environment, the, the more pressure that's going to be applied on the species. So all of this, you get into this question, like under, under what mechanism is one species going to immediately split into more than two? You're like, we have no idea. And this is why we hate polytomies, right? You're like, we can, we can envision a two populations becoming reproductively isolated, but the only way to actually make it happen to where you get three is to have extremely rapid allopatric speciation okay which is technically possible but it would be very unusual and so this is why we don't like polytomies because if you've got one branch splitting into three uh it's it's not a good representation of what we actually see so here are two frog species that are a representation of the temporal isolation rana aurora breeds earlier in the year, Rana boilii breeds later in the year, so they don't reproduce at the same time. Now, two species of crickets. They're in the same geographic area, but they prefer two different, uh, two different habitats. So you've got Gryllus Pennsylvan Pencil Pennsylvanicus in sandy soils, and the Gryllus firmus in grassy soils. Here you've got mechanical isolation, which I didn't provide on the structure, but different shapes to the male reproductive organ in damselflies, which are similar to dragonflies. So you can have mechanical isolation. Here's mechanical isolation in flowers, where you have the flowers that are shaped to allow certain pollinators access. Oh, this is just fun. And so here we've got uh, two cichlids. <laughs> the thin, the, I mean, these are creative names. The thin-lipped cichlid, the thick-lipped cichlid. 
<laughs> so these are in the process of speciating, probably due heavily to sexual selection. And then here are basically the two different ideas. So here's gradual, fueled primarily by what? Natural, Natural selection, punctuated equilibrium, fueled primarily by genetic drift. Good, it's wonderful. All right, our last question. What works against speciation? What factor, what force works against speciation? What was that? The government. <laughs> yeah, I went to a conference. Um, <laughs> when was it? It was in the summer of 2017. Yeah, so it was last summer. And there had been enough time that the current administration had been in place. And uh, somebody was giving a talk on a fungus that is spreading in bat populations. And, and so bats, a number of populations and even a number of different species will all go and hibernate in the same place. And so it provides a mechanism for spreading this fungus that's just destroying bat populations all around the country. And uh, people have been modeling it for a decade to try to figure out how fast it's gonna spread, where it's gonna go next. And somebody was giving a talk uh, on the spread and that the spread has far exceeded any model. The, the, that the fungus is spreading faster than any model had predicted. And somebody asked the question, why? Like, wh why is it spreading so much faster than any model had predicted? And uh, the guy said, I don't know, but I'm sure somebody in the Trump administration does. <laughs> I was like, what does that even mean? I don't understand. But it was funny, so. All right, well, we don't actually have time to finish this question, so we'll finish it on Wednesday, and we'll work very quickly to get through 46. Really, we'll hit the, the highlights. Anders. So do national parks, like, create speciation? <laughs> uh,